Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, it's the end of the year, so it is time for our 11th annual guest list episode. For the guest list, I asked 2023's podcast guests to tell us about the favorite book they read in the past year. Didn't have to be something published in 2023, just something they read and loved. And some of them also told me about which books or authors they hope to read in 2024. Now, Hanukkah's over, Christmas is next week, um, so we're going to celebrate the whole gift-giving thing by giving ourselves a gift of books that brought us joy or changed our lives in some way. And to all of you listeners, I hope you read some good stuff last year and, and that you find some good books to read in the year to come. As 17 guests responded from 2023 to, to my invite for this year. A little lower turnout than usual, but um, I'm good with that. Now, I don't give too much of an intro to the, the guests, so I hope you'll look up this episode and its roster in our archives. If you visit chimeraobscura.com slash VM, you'll find a link to The Guest List 2023. And that has links to just about all the books or authors mentioned in this one, uh, as well as links to each of our participants' episodes from 23. Uh, and while you're there, you can also find links to all 10 of the past editions of The Guest List, which has lots and lots of great recommendations from guests over the years. And if you are interested in my favorite reads from the past year and my 2024 aspirations, I will tell you those at the end, okay? Now let's get started. Lisa Morton, author of The Art of the Zombie Movie, is up first, and she writes, My favorite book read in 2023 won't be published until 2024. It's The Collective by Kate Maruyama. I was privileged to get an advanced look, and it's a spectacularly wicked and insightful look at Hollywood. For 2024, she writes, Over the last 10 years or so, much of my work has been nonfiction, so all of my reading time has gone to research. Just within the last month, though, I finally crossed the last of those off my to-do list, so I'm thrilled with the prospect of returning to reading for fun in 2024. My jam is horror, and that genre has exploded over the last few years with incredible new and prolific talent. So I'm going to be diving into Eric LaRocca, Gwendolyn Kist, Silvia Moreno-Garcia, and Cynthia Palayo, among others. I'm genuinely excited about my 2024 reading, she says. Now, cartoonist Josh Bayer is up next. His new book is Unended, from Uncivilized Press. His favorite read of 2023 is Demons 4, a comic currently being serialized on Instagram by his partner, Hyena Hell. Josh writes, This story has been amazing to watch snake along and become more and more organic, more of a study of behavior, and more of social critique. Hyena flexes her muscles, showing her ability with character design, body language, lettering, and mastery over the specific tools that make this medium what it is. Like the best comics, it's completely unpretentious. It's like if V.T. Hamlin was an anarchist who liked to draw butts and tits and demons' heads getting ripped off. Uh, there'll be a link to Hyena Hell, which is all one word, exactly as it sounds, on Instagram. Josh knows I am a big V.T. Hamlin alley-oop mark, so I'm pretty sure that's why I put a reference in for that. Up next is cartoonist, raconteur, and schmooze king Dean Haspiel. Hello, Gil. This is Dean Haspiel here to briefly talk about a few books and comics I read in 2023 and want to recommend. In terms of novels and memoirs, The Wheel of Doll by Jonathan Ames, the second novel in Ames' new detective crime series. Albeit fiction, it still reads as semi-autobiographical. Fans of HBO's Bored to Death, who miss Ames' particular brand of existential crisis and ennui, will want to pick up his Happy Doll series. Out of Mind by Alan Arkin, which serves as a welcome sequel to his first memoir, An Improvised Life. I'm currently reading Being Henry, The Fonz and Beyond by Henry Wigkler, a tormented and sometimes sad sax journey of an actor who stumbles into becoming the definition of cool and, more importantly, empathetic. In terms of comics and graphic novels, 
Friday, Book Two, On a Cold Winter's Night by Ed Brubaker and Marcos Martin, a brilliant young adult supernatural detective story. I still read a few monthly Marvel comics like Spider-Man, The Fantastic Four. I think my favorite recent single issue of a DC comic was Batman number 130, written by Chip Zdarsky and illustrated by Jorge Jimenez, where Batman falls from the moon to the earth. It needs to be seen and read to be believed. A truly awesome comic book. I love my studio mate Whitney Matheson's daily diary comics, which you can subscribe to on her Substack, which also serves as a heartwarming newsletter filled with hope and cheer. Orbital Operations is another great newsletter written by my friend and writer Warren Ellis. Lots of high-concept stuff to chew on and philosophize. Warren's newsletter has given me many thought exercises that challenges my own work. And up next, Monica by Daniel Klaus and Night Fever by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. As for me, well, after launching two successful comics Kickstarters, COVID Cop and Billy Dogma, I aim to launch another crowdfunded project in early 2024 featuring The Red Hook. Subscribe to my free newsletter via Substack to learn more. Anyway, happy holidays to you and yours, Gil, and to all your wonderful listeners and readers. Dawn Raffle is up next. Her newest book is Boundless as the Sky. She writes, Owing to a work in progress, I have spent an inordinate amount of time reading about elephants. Ask me anything, or don't. However, I am happy to be an evangelist for an elephant-free volume called Indeterminate Inflorescence from Sublunary Editions by Li Shong Bach, translated by Anton Herr. Billed as lectures on poetry, it really is a book of aphorisms, hundreds of them, each one worth the price of admission. For example, poetry is an encounter with unexpected truth. What awaits us when we begin writing a poem is the unknown. Only the unwritten can make us happy. Poetry is the promise of joy in the as-yet unknown. She writes, I am also a fan of Merrill Joan Gerber's essay collection, Revelation at the Food Bank, which will be published momentarily by Sagging Meniscus Press. The collection covers 60 or so years of a writer's life with unusual wit, insight, chutzpah, and flair. Our next guest is Howard Fishman, whose new book is The Amazing Biography of Connie Converse, To Anyone Who Ever Asks. Howard writes, Here are my picks for favorite reads of 2023 in no particular order. Number one, Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. I tend to be cynical about hugely successful, ubiquitous books, which is why this one had sat on my shelf unread after I picked it up off a $1 rack at a used bookstore eons ago. But man, I fell under the spell of McCourt's cadence, humor, and storytelling powers immediately upon picking it up this year at last. Didn't hurt that I had just returned from my first trip to Dublin, besotted by its people, language, and history. Number two, The Train of Small Mercies by David Rowell. W, sorry, R-O-W-E-L-L. A masterful Robert Altman-like treatment of intersecting lives and stories set against the backdrop of the RFK assassination. Number three, The Mysteries by Marissa Silver. A heartbreaking novel essaying loss, love, and grief. Number four, Rusty Brown by Chris Ware. Ware is just in a universe by himself, Howard writes, pure genius. In 2024, I'm looking forward to digging into Jan Fosse's novels and plays, and maybe this is the year I'll finally tackle Proust and succeed. Now here's Paul B. Rainey, whose latest work is the amazing graphic novel, Why Don't You Love Me? Hi, Gil. Hi, everyone. Paul Rainey here, uh, writer and artist of Why Don't You Love Me, published this year by John and Quarterly. Check it out if you've not read it yet. Um, well, I think uh, my list of best of the year is going to be a bit haphazard because, I'll be honest with you, no one's ever asked me to do this sort of thing before. And had I known I was going to get asked this question, I'd have been a bit more mindful about it throughout the year. Um, but I can recommend uh, the novel The Periwinkle Perspective, The Giant Step, by Paul Eccentric. It's a steampunk novel about Captain Periwinkle, who believes he's going to be the first man on the moon, but finds when he gets there he can walk around and breathe quite easily. And we learn pretty quickly that he's actually landed in a quarry in Wales. And a big mystery and adventure ensues. Um, Paul is a performance poet 
and one of the significant joys of reading this book is his turn of phrase. But also, he manages to make even punctuation really good fun, which sounds impossible, but he achieves it. So originally, he intended it like as a one-off novel, then it became a trilogy, then it became six novels, and now I think he plans for nine novels, and that's that was two weeks ago. It's probably 11 or 12 now. But, uh, yeah, he's also in in the process of producing a comic one-off, which I've drawn some pages for, so look out for that. Uh, I think one of my favourite graphic novels this year is Seeds and Stems by Simon Hanselman, which I think was originally published a couple of years ago. But I've not been buying many comics until this year because I earned some money this year for a change. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I'm relatively, I'm shamefully new to Simon's work. Um, I've read Crisis Zone, which I thought was brilliant. Season Stems is great. It's just so funny. The cast of characters is, uh, are brilliant. Um, and But uh, they're just all so debauched. And you're laughing along, and as well as being repulsed and disgusted. And then just as you kind of settle into the debauchery, he manages to find a whole new level of debauchery to to inflict upon the readers via his characters. It's, it's genuinely laugh-out-loud funny, but often very moving, which is a pleasure. Um, I'm looking forward to reading more of Simon's work. Um, obviously, I also read Monica by Daniel Klaus, which is terrific. Check it out. It looks brilliant. Um, I got sent this book by uh, a company I ordered it from, and the postman left it behind the bin because it was too big to fit through the letterbox, and it sat there for a week in the rain. I mean, when I eventually found a parcel, it was sodden, sodden, and yet somehow, because the uh, courier shrink-wrapped it in some uh, in a bag and then put it in the parcel, the book was unscathed. So check that out. Um, I Am Stan by Tom Scully, which is uh, the, uh, a graphic novel biography of the man who was in charge of Marvel for many years. So I read his biography of Jack Kirby, and for some reason I got it into my head that this couldn't be nearly as good as that, but I think it kind of surpasses it. Um, Scully sort of distills events from Lee's life into single pages, and it creates a, what feels at first a dispassionate observer um, witness of his life, but it, somehow it manages to be very affecting and uh, I think quite touching in places. Well done. Um, also, I've been reading lots of Judge Dredd case files this year. I'm up to volume 33. I was a big fan of 2000 AD when I was younger, and I stopped in the late 90s. But I realised there's probably years and years' worth of John Wagner stories I haven't read. And I think John Wagner is one of the most underrated comic writers there is, and cultural influences. So I'm looking forward to next year reading lots more John Wagner. I'm getting into the uh, EC archive books that Dark Horse are publishing, but I'm limiting myself to one book a month. Um, yeah, and there's probably lots of proper good stuff coming out next year, none of which um, I can think of at the moment. But, yeah, thank you for having me. Cheers. Bye-bye. Oh, happy Christmas and happy New Year. Cheers. Our next guest is Patrick McDonnell, cartoonist of Mutts and the new book The Superhero's Journey. 2023, he writes, Escape from Hawaii by Jack Handy. We can all use a good laugh, and this one is fearless in its silliness. And I Am That by Sri Nisargad Nisargadatta Maharaj, a book I read every year, he says. And that's why his one 2024 item is also I Am That by Sri Nisargadat Nisargadatta Maharaj. I'm so sorry about the mispronunciation. Uh, but up next is Priscilla Gilman, whose latest book is The Critic's Daughter. She writes, my favorite book that I read this year was This Other Eden by Paul Harding. 
just a remarkable novel. Authors and books I hope to tackle in 2024 include The Bee Sting by Paul Murray, Annie Arnaud's The Years, and Septology by Jan Fosse. Our next guest is Andrew Porter. Now, while I enjoyed the heck out of his short story collection, The Disappeared, I resent him because he really overachieved on this one. Um, he writes, in no particular order, these are some of the best books I read in 2023, or at least some of my favorites. Rachel Cusk's novels, Transit and Kudos, I read Outline, the first in the trilogy the year before. Annie Ernaux's novels, A Frozen Woman and The Years. Elena Ferrante's novels, The Lost Daughter and My Brilliant Friend. Deb Olin Unferth's memoir, Revolution, The Year I Fell in Love and Went to Join the Sandinistas. Priscilla Gilman's memoir, The Cr Critic's Daughter. Stephanie Austin's memoir, Something I Might Say. Richard Mirabella's novel, Brother and Sister Enter the Forest, Manuel Munoz's collection, Zigzagger and the Faith Healer of Olive Avenue, Keith Palapo Lesmeister's novella, Mississippi River Museum, Anthony Varallo's collection of Flash, What Did You Do Today?, Eun Hik Jung's uh, story collection, Beauty Looks Down on Me, in translation, Madeleine Lucas's novel, Thirst for Salt, Idra Nove's novel, Take What You Need, Alexander Chi's edition of the Best, Best American Essays, and Emma Klein's novel, The Guest. Uh, he writes, I know there are some, probably many, I'm forgetting, but these are some off the top of my head. <clears throat> so yes, I resent him for overachieving on this one. And he writes, in 2024, I'm excited to read Sigrid Nunez's new novel, The Vulnerables, which I bought but haven't started yet. I'm also looking forward to reading the rest of the books in Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Novels Quartet, Justin Torres's Blackouts, Tommy Orange's forthcoming novel, Wandering Stars, Kimberly King Parsons' forthcoming novel, We Were the Universe, Nam Le's forthcoming book, 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem, and Maggie Milner's Couplets, a love story, long on my to-be-read list. Also, this might not really count because I've already read an advanced copy of it, but everyone else should be excited to read Christopher Johnsma's forthcoming novel, Our Narrow Hiding Places, which comes out in August. It's excellent, he writes. So up next is Sarah Lipman, whose latest book is the novel Lech. The truth is, she writes, my reading habits were rather lackluster this year, overtaken by student work and blurb requests, but I'm always looking for a book that cracks me open in a way, shifts my thinking, reminds me that I'm still alive. These are not always the most universally lauded by any means or the most conventional, and certainly they almost always arrive fraught with their own host of problems, but this year's honors go to two oldies. John Irving's The World According to Garp, which jumped the shark too many times to count, and Yaakov Shabtai's Past Continuous, whose Joycean language and fraught humanity and existential timeliness blew me away. That said, I did have one absolutely guilty pleasure book, Tom Lake by Ann Patchett, which I listened to on audio narrated by the fabulous Meryl Streep. I fell so purely in love with this generous, aching, and spellbinding story, thanks in large part to Streep's voice, that I found myself sneaking out for extended walks or disappearing into kitchen projects in order to justify long stretches of listening. In 2024, she writes, I'm hoping to get back to reading for pleasure and to tackling some of the many titles occupying prime real estate, books I've acquired but that are gathering dust. First up will be Adam Levin's The Instructions, which is being re-released this March in a two-volume set, and I've heard it called The Greatest Jewish American Novel of All Time. I also, I also plan to dig into Gina Berrio, whose stories Peter Orner raves about. Knausgaard is also taking up a lot of room, and yet I've been resistant to him. Not sure why. Have you read Knausgaard, Gil? Should I? Well... Uh, I have not read Knausgaard. Uh, I figure it is way past time from when it was hip to actually read him. Uh, so eh, maybe Sarah and I will both give him a shot next year. Uh, Jonathan Papernick is up next. Uh, we talked about his short story collection, Gallery of the Disappeared Men, when we recorded this spring. But he also had a novel out this year, I Am My Beloveds. He writes... I hate to say it, but I don't know if I read any full books this year, except for a book about the Nazis and their drug use, that's blitzed, and Rick Rubin's The Creative Act. Just a lot of writing, reading plays, and tons of student work. Feeling very depleted on the creative front, and nothing on my agenda for next year, either. I would like to tackle all of Paul, Paul Bowles' work in 2024, since they're all on audio now. Unfortunately, it seems podcasts have ruined my ability to listen to audiobooks. And I'm always happy to ruin somebody's ability to read, so uh, I take credit or blame for that one. 
Now, our next guest is James McMullen, whose latest book is Hello World, The Body Speaks in the Drawings of Men. And those are gouache sketches of men that, that James did. It's a really fantastic book. Uh, wordless pretty much, but well, actually there's, there's notes written into each page about his subjects and his, his technique. But anyway, he writes, I'm reading Heather Cox Richardson's Democracy Awakening, Stan Herman's memoir, Uncross Your Legs, and rereading Frank O'Hara's poem, In Memory of My Feelings. I really enjoyed my daughter's strong novel, A Likely Story, he writes, and I'm looking forward to reading Ed L. Rodriguez's illustrated memoir, Worm. Which reminds me, I need to pitch Rodriguez on, on recording a show next year. But up next is Bill Griffith, whose graphic biography of Ernie, uh, Ernie Bushmiller, the creator of Nancy, uh, Three Rocks, is one of the best books I read this year. So I'm giving away a little bit of, of what comes at the end of this one. Three Rocks will be on the list. Bill writes... Next to my Barca lounger in the living room, at different stages of reading, are Monica by Daniel Klaus, Flamed Out, The Underground Adventures of Comics Genius Willie Murphy, Mutt and Jeff, a 1960 10 cent Harvey comic, and Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, a 12 cent DC comic book from 1964. He writes, Rather than read a title from start to finish, I like to skip from one to the other as the moment strikes me, until they're done, possibly due to the zippy part of my brain taking charge. Our next guest is Peter Rostovsky, whose debut graphic novel, Damnation Diaries, is awfully good. Peter writes, This is so hard, in particular since my reading habits are so pulverized by this year's teaching duties. I read for class, often rereading. I read news, a lot, stuff about politics, AI, etc. But to get me to finish a book read for pleasure? That's hard. At least it was this year, with my own book coming out, needing all kinds of editing and support and promotion and steering. So here are a couple of things I did read, and a couple on my list. I read Night Fever by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. It was a fast trip, like an episode of The Twilight Zone or a delirious, sweat-soaked dream. Dark, subterranean, a Freudian study of longing and middle age. Like so much of Brubaker's writing and Phillips' art, you get sucked in immediately— and then the darkness of their crafted world, both retro-noir and completely now, stays with you. I keep thinking about this book as a lesson in swift storytelling that's episodic, like the best TV. How much can one pack into an hour? As we all know from our favorite shows, a lot. Meg Ellison's The Pill. This is really a novelette, but also packs in sensitive and detailed character development, world-building, and dystopian probabilities now shockingly coming to pass. Ellison writes from the heart, and the language is rich with observation and melancholy. I read it with my painting class, and it left an indelible mark on us. No spoilers, but it's dark and sensual, with ample servings of body horror and pleasure all thrown into the mix. I'm keen on reading more of her writing, so let's add number one fan to the, re to the to read list. Among other items here, it sits on my shelf, is Deb Todd Wheeler's Radio Silence, Book of Walks. I watched Deb present it in a lecture, and it's a marvel of bookmaking art. But it's also a deep journey into grief and the solidarity we find with our fellow travelers on this earth through shared stories, observation, and listening. Nature, reflection on life's fragility, memoir, and local landscape histories interlace through its beautifully designed pages. It is a book about silence, and I'm trying to find the right silent moment to spend with it. Scott Samuelson is up next. He left a voicemail on our Google Voice number with this one. Uh, there's a little glitch in the middle, but it's just a joke about publishers clearing house mailers. Scott's the author of Rome as a Guide to the Good Life, a Philosophical Grand Tour. Hey, this is Scott Samuelson with my favorite read of 2023. You're certainly welcome to use my voice on your podcast. Um. I like to go on walks through Oakland Cemetery in Iowa City, which is full of great graves and several graves of writers, as you might expect from the hometown of the Iowa Writers Workshop. My favorite gravestone there is James Allen McPherson's, a uh, bronzed version of the derby hat he liked to wear hangs on a black marble bench. And the epitaph from his short story collection, uh, Elbow Room, makes you walk around the seat to read it. The epitaph says, I think love must be the ability to suspend one's intelligence for the sake of something. At the basis of love, therefore, must 
live imagination. In a bronze ashtray on the seat, a bronze cigarette is burning, well, at least in our imagination, for him to come back and finish it. Along the marble back is a day's jackpot of bronze mail, an envelope from his more famous friend, Ralph Ellison, one from Fabian's seafood truck. I sometimes get some golf shrimp from them, too. One's addressed to Daddy and our dear brother. One from Publishers Clearinghouse. Uh, there's an opened envelope from his old teacher, Alan Leibowitz, that says, all the letters we've exchanged over 50 years, this one the shortest, love, and a long history of love, Alan. Carved in the off-white marble base is a Japanese character that my Japanese friend Masai tells me means bond, as in my word is my bond, she told me. I'd read several of McPherson's short stories, but going by that grave and wondering about that Japanese character led me to his great book, Crab Cakes, published in 1998, which has been the favorite book that I read in 2023. It's described as a memoir, and it does relate stories from his time in Iowa City, Maryland, Cambridge, and Japan. It deals with questions of race in America in far more profound ways than we're used to encountering. But fundamentally... It's a set of profound ruminations on what it means to be bonded with each other before we end up in the cemetery. Cartoonist Carl Stevens is up next. His latest book is a graphic novel, Mother Nature, from a script by Jamie Lee Curtis and Russell Goldman. Carl writes, my favorite books in, I read in 2023 are Same Bed, Different Dreams by Ed Park, The Slip by Prudence Piper, Dear Minnie by Natalie Norris, and Why Don't You Love Me by Paul B. Rainey. The books I hope to tackle in 2024 are The Power Broker by Robert Caro and Moby Dick by Herman Melville, which is the definition of overachieving. Now, Hoche Anderson is our final podcast. His latest book was the conclusion to his two-part graphic novel, Godhead. Ho writes... I read so much, I can't remember half of what I go through. Yeah, yeah, humble brag. Uh, but two that stand out are Heat 2 by Michael Mann and Meg Gardner. Disappointing ending, though. And So Say We All, the complete, uncensored, unauthorized oral history of Battlestar Galactica by Edward Gross and Mark A. Altman. For 2024, he writes, Cormac McCarthy, specifically Blood Meridian. I love the road, and I hear this is even more extreme. He is, in fact, correct. Uh, Blood Meridian is extreme in the extreme. I read it in 2022, I think, for the first time. And holy crap, is that a, a heck of a book? So that is something good to aspire to in 2024. And for me, sheesh, uh, it has been a weird year for me. And it's not just a weird reading year, but that's been part of it. Uh, any of you who follow this whole thing know I've gone through some ups and downs. Um, for guest list purposes, um, we're going to separate the books I read for the show versus those I read for quote unquote fun. Um, thing is, I, I, as I did that, I realized I didn't do a ton of extracurricular reading this year. Um, one of the big projects, John, or Jan Fosse's Septology, um, just did not move me the way I was expecting. Um, the literary critic Merv Emery wrote this great piece about it. I was really inspired and, and got on it, and I just didn't get it. Um, and, and a writer pal of mine mentioned the same thing on Twitter, and I, I zapped him with a, oh, thank God it wasn't just me. Um, but anyway, so that took up a, a chunk of early part of the year. And another chunk of my reading, um, I've been rereading Thomas Pynchon's novels. I In 2022, I finally read Against the Day, the last novel of his I had not read. And this year, inspired by my talk with uh, Stephen Wine, uh, Wina about his Allen Ginsberg book, I kind of got started up on reading V, and that led me to rereading all the pension. I'm currently uh, closing in on finishing Inherent Vice. And um, I don't want to cite those as best ofs. I mean, I could easily just say, oh, gravity's rainbow. But uh, I will say that I probably should have done this reread of Mason and Dixon in print rather than on my Kindle, because I remember enjoying it a lot more when I read it in, 20, in 1998, you know, as a, a print book. So we'll see. Anyway, still need to finish Inherent Vice and then reread Bleeding Edge, and that will finish up that Quixotic project. Doubt I will finish that this year because there's only 12 days left as I record this. So my favorite non-podcast reading book in 2023 Faith, Hope, and Carnage by Nick Cave and Sean O'Hagan. 
this is a series of conversations um, between them, and I found myself moved and inspired by this discussion of of loss, creation, performance, religion, community, compassion, um, what we have to sacrifice and, and what we have to hold on to, I guess. I only started listening to Nick Cave's music this year. See, I know he's been around decades and decades, and I somehow just kind of missed the boat. Um, but I really groove on the creative self he embodies. This started with me watching 20,000 Days on Earth, movie that, about him that came out uh, 10 years ago. And and this this book, uh, which came out in, in 22 and then has a reissue or came out in paperback with a new uh, um, uh, final chapter in 23, uh, it gives us a sense of the changes Nick Cave underwent in his life and how he's become who he is. I mean, it, it, it's meant as a memoir, but in the form of, of interviews. And you get this sense of what was seeded in his earlier life that 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 grew and that carried out the, the, the promise of this ongoing self of today. But you also get the sense of the bad stuff that was there, the weeds, what needed to be uprooted and, and, and torn out um, to help him clear himself and become someone else or become who maybe you're meant to be. Um, some of the book is about the process of making certain records of his, including Ghostine, which has become my, my go-to record for when I'm doing my yoga workout, Don't Ask. Uh, and I knew nothing about any of the music before we started recording or for sort of reading this, but that's not important for understanding how important the, the creative work is to Nick Cave. And O'Hagan asks wonderful questions and his personality resonates through the conversation. It's not just like some generic Q and a, this is a person with his own viewpoints and his own history with cave. So it's a really fascinating book and one that I, I enjoyed the heck out of, um, have already dipped back into and, and returned to. So, and I've started listening to Nick Cave's music. So that's uh, another 2023 thing. Uh, now my second fave was the short novel Piranesi by Susanna Clark. I never read her big one, uh, Jonathan Strange and Dr. Norell, but this was a Kindle deal, I think, uh, like a buck ninety nine or something. And and I think Warren Ellis had mentioned it in his email as a, a recommendation. So I, I picked it up one. I uh, picked it up on, on the Kindle. And one evening I just started it on a whim and found myself absolutely transfixed. Um, the novel is in the form of journal entries by a man who lives by himself in a very strange palace without too clear an understanding of who he is. And he doesn't know that he doesn't know who he is. That is, he understands the world around him, these the strange statues that fill the countless, countless halls of this palace, which he's mapped out over the, the years, and the, the sea beneath him and the, the tides and rhythms and the way it bubbles up into the, the lower levels of the, the place. And... And the novel consists of his realization that something brought him here and that his life truly is a mystery. But that's just the, the, the plot, vaguely. Um, what makes this book a wonder, besides the tension of whether the narrator will, will figure things out as the reader starts to clue that there is something going on here, um, it's, it's his relationship to the world around him, to those statues and the, the tides and the bones of dead people he has stumbled across and the birds who nest in, in some of the halls and the weird sense you get that it's all living to him. And Clark manages to evoke this perception of the world as living ideas and how that's different, maybe lost to how we live in our, our imminent world. It's a weirdly beautiful book with a compelling plot and action and a mystery and unforgettable imagery and it's only like 260 pages so not a doorstop like her her previous novel so Piranesi by by Susanna Clark go get that one um the other book that knocked the heck out of me 
uh, was was The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. And I read that in advance of a podcast that never happened uh, with Liz Hand because she had to, to leave the event we were at. But I'll put this in the non-show category because I was not interviewing Shirley Jackson. It is the only Jackson I've read besides a lottery. And it's scary as fuck. Um, I, I mean, I know she's a gothic horror writer. I didn't really know how horrifying it would get. The setup of this this novel, a uh, paranormal researcher brings a couple of volunteers to spend time in a haunted house, and, and one of the other occupants or participants is a uh, relative of the, the family that owns it. Um, it could be an easy trope for, you know, chills and, and thrills or whatever, but I was not expecting the setup, the camaraderie and play among the the occupants, the way their characters all unfold in relation to each other and the, the fun they have and the ways they get to know each other before things start to go south, where you can see in them what's what the house is going to do to them and how much bigger it is than they are. And that made it all so much more terrifying. And next year, I'm hoping to get to uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which when I mentioned this book to Michael Durda, the, the great Washington Post book reviewer, uh, he assured me is so much scarier than, than uh, The Haunting of Hill House. I'm really in for it. So those were some of the, the non-podcast books that I read that, that really got to me in 2023. As far as podcast reading goes, there are a lot more books on, on that side. I'm going to try, try to keep this brief or at least hit on a bunch of them. Let me just say, if you're a 2023 guest and I didn't mention your book, it's not because I didn't like it. Uh, I've really dug pretty much everything I read this year. But as I look over the roster of books, it's really tough to pull out just a couple. And the alternative is going all Andrew Porter and reciting like 20 of them. I loved Andrew Porter's short story collection, The Disappeared. Um, during a conversation, I joked that it was like an album by the national except in prose form and i don't consider that to be an insult uh but anyway let's let's get to the the list um let's go with comics first for for comics um i think my faves were the aforementioned uh uh three rocks bill griffith's biography and meta exploration of, of ernie bushmiller uh and the comic strip nancy um Bill's just on an incredible run, continuing his Zippy the Pinhead comic strip, but also creating uh, new work like this. That that's he's a sign of a master of comics and somebody who feels passionately about the stuff that he's he's making art for, uh, making art about. Um, also, Doug Paul B. Rainey's "Why Don't You Love Me," which takes a weird sitcom premise and infuses it with science fiction apocalypticism, if that's a word, and real heart and, and meaning in, in a fusion that's completely unexpected, but works just beautifully. I also loved Patrick McDonald's The Superhero's Journey, which remixed old Marvel comics with, we'll say, mystic wisdom, uh, memoir, uh, a sense of the wonder of love, all the, the things that infuse Patrick's work. Um, and he managed to, to create this beautiful tribute to, to Marvel Comics, tribute to the the, the philosophers and, and mystics who he adores and, and gets a lot of, of life force from, and to, to what comics mean to us. It's, um, well, it, it hit me when I needed it, when I didn't realize I needed it. Oh, uh, the other book, I, I think about it, I'm looking over the list, um, Francis Rothbart, The Tale of a Fastidious Feral by Thomas Woodruff. I read that early this year. I cannot even begin to describe this book, uh, which is, uh, God, I, again, I don't know how to say it. it's a graphic novel, but there's not so much of the panel to panel progression. The form is like, is unlike anything I've ever seen in comics. Um, it is these oversized pages, these, these set pieces, opera, costume debuts, um, this this strange fable like story to it. It's it's visually, like I say, unlike anything I've ever checked out. It is a, a gorgeous book, and it keeps cropping up in my mind. Uh, nearly a year since I read it, so that that puts it on this list of um, my favorite reads of of twenty twenty three. Now, in prose fiction, uh, my fave was probably Ravage and Son uh, by Jerome Charon. Uh, that is an operatic crime story of the old Jewish Lower East Side, and it was what felt like a deeply loved book. 
it's um well it, it's got a lot of the violence and a lot of the over the top emotionality and the beautiful beautiful prose that Jerome brings to every page so ravage and sun that's um that is a heck of a book I also, for sheer fun, loved Matt Ruff's sequel to Lovecraft Country, The Destroyer of Worlds. I love Matt's storytelling um, and his return to the characters and universe he, he created in the, the first novel is just an absolute blast. Um, there is no sense of fan service here. He's not the, you know, oh, I'm going to play the same notes a little differently. He is a writer who knows and loves his craft. And he's just returning to a world that he clearly enjoys the heck out of. So the destroyer of worlds, uh, go read Lovecraft country first and then, then read this one. You will, you'll probably read both of them in two days. If you're anything like me, and if you get an appreciation of Matt's absolutely compelling and propulsive prose. Now, nonfiction is uh, way too broad of a category. So um, we're going to break it out. Uh, biography first. Howard Fishman's To Anyone Who Ever Asks, The Life, Music, and Mystery of Connie Converse was one of the most amazing books I read this year. Um, Howard managed to follow the thread of a song overheard at a Christmas party and stumbles into the story of a woman who could have been a major singer-songwriter, but was just a few years too early and just, just not the right person in the right moment. And as he follows that thread, we learn even more about the, the amazing life she led and the, the things she tried to do and, and like her work in peace studies at a, a time of, of escalating war and the way she kind of broke gender stereotypes in, in, in the workplace and, and the things we know and can't know uh, about her, her family and the filing cabinet with missing files, like it's a, a Charles Portis novel, um, the, the overarching mystery of her, her disappearance in the mid seventies. This thing is a phenomenal book. It, it brings its era to, to life and brings us face to face with, with the unknowability of another person. And, and, and despite everything people leave behind, how much we struggle to, to understand them. Um, and to just to learn what was there, why someone did what they did. It's it's a beautiful book uh, to anyone who ever asks. I, I've loved this one. I've foisted it off on a few pals of mine. Go get it. Howard Fishman, to anyone who ever asks. Um, the other biography I plotzed over was Willard Spiegelman's book on the poet Amy Clampett, Nothing Stays Put. I knew little to nothing of Clampett's poetry, and Willard did a, a phenomenal job of fusing the biography, the, the life story, and the poetry and its writing into a single narrative. Um, it, it reminded me in parts of uh, Langdon Hammer's biography of James Merrill, where the poems are part of the life story, not in a you know biographical fallacy sort of way, but um, Willard really shows how the poems emerge and erupted and what it meant to be a late bloomer like Clampett. Um, I also dug Andrew Sisman's two John le Carre biographies, um, especially in the way the follow-up that came out this year, The Secret Life of John le Carre, kind of fills in the thing that was missing in the first bio uh, from about eight or nine years ago. It's a fantastic project. Uh, reading two of them together was was amazing. Um, that That's a real tough biographical feat that, that Sisman pulled off. So uh, those are my three biographies. Um, to anyone who ever asks, nothing stays put, and the secret life of John le Carre. Now for essays, hands down, my absolute fave, Philip Lopate, A Year and a Day, an experiment in essays. Um, pound for pound, best personal essayist out there. Um, these pieces from 2016 and 2017, they are just filled with wit and, and charm and self-deprecation and uh, self-congratulation in parts and an urgency. Uh, unlike some of the longer pieces, there's a, a compression to some of these that are, are well, it's compelling. Uh, so A Year and a Day by Philip Lopate. Now, because this is my year of uh, death adjacency, uh, my health is fine, but I have, um, I've, I've seen friends go through some things. I greatly, greatly appreciated Joseph Moninger's uh, memoir of his, his cancer life, Goodbye to Clocks Ticking, How We Live While Dying. 
Um, that's a really good book. I, I'm glad we got to sit down and talk. I think it was like a 7 a.m. Uh, remote session that we did, and it was something where I was just charged up with sitting down with this guy and making sure we were able to to, to share something. Um, Michael Denony's collection on Christopher Street, Life, Sex, and Death After Stonewall. That was a powerful, powerful read before I found Michael dead in his apartment when I showed up for our podcast in April. Um, I was so looking forward to this conversation. Um, the, the book is, it collects all these pieces from uh, uh, Michael's journalism and, and criticism and his eulogies for friends who had died of AIDS and, and a whole lot of other pieces that um, it makes me even sadder that we didn't get to sit down and talk. But anyway, that's technically for the podcast, uh, that book and our my whole experience that I've talked about ad nauseum this year, um, it continues to reverberate in me. So, so there's that. Um, then there is the unclassifiable slash recency bias entries. Um, and that's the books I just read for the last two episodes of the show. Jarrett Ernest's Valid Until Sunset and Christian Wyman's My Bright Abyss. He held Radical Light and his newest one, Zero at the Bone. Those all wallop the heck out of me. And in concert, they they sort of have me contemplating art and faith and and my tension between those and my 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 own place in the world. Uh Jarrett's book has inspired a project that I hope to make in 2024, but you'll get more about that in uh, uh next year's guest list. And Christian's book has me thinking more about that intersection of art and faith. I mean Jarrett's book uh, book does too, uh but in his case it's more about art and grief and memory, I think. Anyway, go get Valid Until Sunset. Go get Christian Wyman's last three, we'll say essay uh, uh, collections. There are also poetry and poetry appreciation and, and anthologizing, and they're unclassifiable, like I said. Anyway, that is, um, that's, that's a bunch of the books I really enjoyed in 2023. As far as next year goes, uh, I already have a stack of review copies for 2024's guests, and I am just plotting over this stuff. Uh, Amor Tolls, Emily Rabiteau, David Small, Maurice Velacoup, Cynthia Carr, Leela Corman, um, and a bunch of others that are that are pending. They're, 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 they should be here in a couple of weeks or months, including Brad Gooch's biography of Keith Haring. I haven't received that one yet, but I look at that stack and think, man, I got a, I got a great year of podcast reading ahead of me. Now, for extracurricular reading, I could make stuff up. I'm, um, Peter Matheson's uh, The Snow Leopard is on my list. I'll be recording with his biographer, Lance Richardson. Um, I think in 2025 is when that bio is coming out. So I asked Lance, give me some Matheson recommendations, and The Snow Leopard was the first one. Um, as per my brother's recommendation, Shirley Hazard's The Transit of Venus is also on my to-be-read stack. Um I'm going to keep my project of reading two pages of Emily Dickinson's poems every morning um, in hopes that I start to get smarter, I guess. Might also read Jerome Charon's novel about Dickinson um, and his his book about her letters to A Loaded Gun. Um, also, I, I told Jerome I would read... Um, Cesar, a novel of his about World War II. He contends that one is up there with Ravage and Son, so I guess I got that ahead of me, too. And honestly, you know, I could make up a big list of stuff. Uwe Johnson's anniversaries came up a few months ago, that big two-volume slipcase monster from New York Review of Books, but I'm more interested in just finding out what the future's going to bring me, man. You know, I went into this year not realizing the pension thing was going to happen, um... You know, let's just see where it goes. So that is it for the 2023 edition of the Virtual Memory Show guest list. Thanks for sticking around and thanks for listening throughout the year. Um, between us, this year has been pretty rough on me and I'm uh, glad to have the show for a whole lot of reasons. But but mainly because it, it takes me out of my world and into a larger one. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist.
So visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 